Batiste and give a more thorough introduction of Roger Genver Smith. Dr. Batiste is an Associate Professor of Black Studies and English at UC Santa Barbara, and she's the director of the Hemispheric South's Research Initiative. Her specialty areas include black performance studies, African American literature and culture, American studies and cultural studies. Her book, Darkening Mirrors, Imperial Representation in Depression-Era African American Performance, focuses on the relationship between power and identity in black performance cultures to reimagine black life and ways of being. Her current book project studies violence and affect in millennial black urban performance cultures here in LA. In addition, she's also a creative writer and performer. Her solo show, Stack of Obits, about street murder in Los Angeles has been performed nationally and internationally. Roger Genver Smith is an internationally acclaimed actor, writer, and director. He's directed, uh, who's created a prolific body of work on stage and on screen. Smith's work is frequently developed through intense archival immersion and improvisation, and he teaches a workshop in performing history at Cal Arts. As I mentioned before, he's had many collaborations with the director Spike Lee. After his debut in Lee's first studio film, School Days, he appeared in the Oscar-nominated Do the Right Thing, where he improvised the stuttering hero, Smiley. He then played a Russian roulette playing gangster in Malcolm X, a guitar playing cop in Get on the Bus, the street philosopher Big Time Willie in He Got Game, a hard-nosed detective in Summer of Sam, and an opportunist insurance salesman in Chirac. He's also in many other film and TV projects, most recently The Birth of a Nation and Bitch, and the acclaimed indie films Muslim and Better Must Come, in which he plays the Prime Minister of Jamaica. He also appear, appeared in the cult classics Deep Cover and King of New York, as well as Eve's Bayou, Hamlet, All About the Bed Bayou, Hamlet, and on Oz. Before entering the Yale School of Drama in a class year which included none other than Angela Bassett, Charles S. Dutton, and John Turturro, he studied history, earning an undergraduate degree in American Studies at Occidental College. He's continued to combine his interests in history, culture, and theater through a broad stage repertoire of man, one-man plays, which includes Frederick Douglass Now, Christopher Columbus 1992, The Watts Towers Project, in honor of Jean-Michel Basquiat, two, fly, two Fires, Patriot Act, Juan and John, The End of Black History Month, Who Killed Bob Marley, Iceland, and with Mark Broyard, Inside the Creole Mafia. Roger is truly a one of a kind. Um, he's really a national treasure and a great artist, and we're so fortunate to have him live here among us in Los Angeles and keep creating these great works. And it's an honor to have his work here again at the Hammer Museum. So now please join me in welcoming Stephanie Batiste and Roger Genver Smith. Thank you so much for that beautiful, stunning tribute and memorial. Um, I have so many questions, and I know the audience has questions too. So we'll talk for a little while, and then uh, hear what you guys have to say. Sir, <laughs> I want to stand up and clap again. <laughs> Can you tell us about how you developed this show and what drove you to put it together? Well, I think it was all telepathic. <laughs> <coughs> no, but it is. In the same way that it was telepathic that we dressed alike this evening. Oh <laughs> I got dressed in Echo Park and you got dressed in Santa Barbara. But... <laughs> and the coordination <laughs> is stunning. All of these layers of history and simultaneity. Absolutely. You know, 
we've been calling it for a long time, not so much a performance as it is a prayer. And it's extraordinary that we now have the opportunity to pray with the world at large, although we have been praying with the world at large and taking this play all over the world. But it's nice to be able to get this out on Netflix, where it is uh, immediately subtitled in 42 languages. So all of your Icelandic friends, let them know. <laughs> all of your Urdu-speaking comrades, please let them know that we have subtitles just for them. Um, you know, we thought that this was going to be simply uh, a thought for the season of mourning, summer of 2012. Um, when I opened my laptop on June 17th, Father's Day 2012, and read the news today, oh boy, that Rodney King had drowned in his backyard swimming pool. I was moved and I wanted to know why, why I felt the way that I felt and why, <clears throat> by extension, my potential audience might be. So I jumped immediately into the archives and by the second week of August 2012, I was there with uh, Kirk Wilson and Jessica Hanna. Um, trying to work it out at Bootleg Theater, which is my home theater. And more uh, information emerged. For example, the autopsy report, the fall of that year, which fueled us with more spiritual fire, I think, mm -hmm. even if it came in PDF form. And then this thing called America happened. In the year 2011, we didn't know these words, but they are now part of the American lexicon. Words like Trayvon Martin, words like Ferguson, words like Baltimore, words like Charleston, world, words like Black Lives Matter. Those words were not part of the American lexicon the year before we began this journey. And tragically, this story has uh, continued to achieve a certain resonance. Um, and wherever we have been with this on stage, and it's largely been uh, in direct um, collaboration with my brother, Kirk Wilson, um, there is a Rodney King story. There is a Rodney King story in Amsterdam. There is a Rodney King story in London, in Charlotte, in Chicago, in Oakland, in Brooklyn. When we <clears throat> opened um, Rodney King in Brooklyn, it was the evening of the non-indictment of Officer Pantaleo in the choking death of Eric Garner in Staten Island. And Brooklyn sounded like LA. There were helicopters everywhere. People were stopping traffic, and rightfully so, on the Brooklyn Bridge. And by the time we came to the finale of that uh, engagement, which was attended by my family and by Spike's family as well, we decided that we should have a town meeting, but beyond the town hall meeting, we should spontaneously march into the street. And so we marched out into the street and we stopped traffic for an hour. And we let it be known that this was simply not a play and that the choking of Eric Garner was not simply a Spike Lee movie, although it's simply, it certainly resembled one called Do the Right Thing. Um, and this particular piece of theater then became part of a process of citizenship uh, in which not only I and my uh, collaborators were involved, but uh, one in which the world at large could be involved. And um, 
you know, we've been at this for a while, um, since at least 1619, and uh, 1492, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, this thing called resistance. And, um, you know, how wonderful it is now to gather in the uh, Billy Wilder Theater in comfortable seats and uh, have an uncomfortable conversation with our city, a city that burned 25 years ago. When it started burning, my man Mark Broyard, Mark, where you at? He called me and said, Roger, can you believe we're doing this again? Because we had been there in 65. We were kids. Mm -hmm. National Guard rolling up and down Santa Barbara Avenue, now Martin Luther King Boulevard. And the big story of our youth was now the big story of our young adulthood. It bracketed our lives in a certain way. And we had been referencing Rodney King in our work since March of 1991. When Rodney King was beaten, Mark Broyard, Ben Caldwell, Ben, where you at? Wesley Groves, Kim Nickerson, and I were at Chaos Gallery with a big map of Los Angeles behind me. I played kind of uh, CNN, you know, uh, anchor person, pointing to places of conflagration. Now, mind you, this was a year before, a year and change before the insurrection slash uprising slash riot in slash rebellion in 92. Mark Broyard went outside. We did a live remote, you know. Mark Broyard gave proper cover-up techniques for, for black men, showed black men how to protect their cranium, their genitals. Kim Nickerson went out there and noted the disappearance of black women in anticipation of what we now know was the tragic and savage disappearing and murdering of black women by <clears throat> the grim sleeper. So we noted early on that it was not simply black men who were under attack, it was an entire community in a sense that was under attack in this particular locale. In some ways, those layers of history that you give us don't change because history continues to repeat um, cyclically. And uh, I think I find it fascinating that you are able to connect all of these modes of communication, media, archiving, uh, different threads and trajectories of, of, of maintaining history and memory. So between books, um, PDFs, which you make a joke about, but are not, right? The, the, the internet comments, um, Mr. King's book, uh, and all the independent history and uh, memory making that you mark. Um, you, you give us this long uh, cyclical history in Rodney King that's so complicated. Well, it's a history that's worth reading. I think it's important to know that Andrew Jackson was not around during the Civil War. <laughs> I don't think it's funny. I think that the greatest threat is not right-wingism, but ignorance. And, you know, um, my son went to a book fair the other day and was very excited about a book about Abraham Lincoln and insisted that I read it. And I said, son, here's some stamps. 
I want you to send this book to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. <laughs> Um, I think it's critical. I think it's critical that, that we overstand, not understand, that we overstand how history affects our present American moment. In 1992, uh, my man, Mark Anthony Thompson, where are you at, Mark Anthony Thompson? And I did a piece called Christopher Columbus, 1992. Now, those of you who are of a certain vintage, <laughs> remember that 1992 was the 500th anniversary of the discovery of America by Christopher Columbus. So instead of just coming out and saying, you know, Columbus was a bad guy, I played Columbus, uh, who was a guy who was still among us who's a lounge entertainer with political aspirations, <laughs> who runs a travel agency on the side. And he's brought into the theater a man who's holding up a sign that says, we'll work for food. So he takes him to McDonald's, gets him a Happy Meal, and employs him as a DJ. Well, that's Mark Anthony Thompson, mm -hmm. AKA Chocolate Genius. And Christopher Columbus promises a song, a dance, and a magic trick. And the magic trick that he promises is that he will be transformed before your very eyes into a black man. So he is transformed into a black man by 56 electronic blows, rendered him by Mark Anthony Thompson, inspired by those 56 blows received by Rodney King. And he is stripped down to his boxer shorts and his gold chain. And he is then devoured by a polar bear. Because there was a boy by the name of Juan Perez, if you remember this, who on a dare climbed into the polar bear cage in the Brooklyn Zoo. And the tabloids the next morning were horrific. A picture of his corpse half eaten by the polar bear and the headline saying, help mommy, they're biting me hard. Now I thought that this was, you know, a great representation of the treatment of urban youth during the Reagan era. Mm -hmm. And so we took the voice of Ronald Reagan at the 1992 Republican convention where he said, it's not history that matters, as much in America as our destination. And Mark Anthony took that voice of Ronald Reagan and he slowed it down so that it became the growl of the polar bear. And poor Christopher Columbus, who has been transformed into the boy, Juan Perez, is screaming, Ayudame, ayudame, mommy. Help, help, mommy. They're biting me hard, mommy. Mark Anthony jumps down off of the DJ stand, snatches the gold chain off the neck of Christopher Columbus, and runs out of the theater. And he's been running ever since, as have we all, we're running away from our past. And we're even more infected 25 years later with a historical amnesia. It's an epidemic. So I thank you for being here. I thank you for making the investment uh, in this work and in all work, which is trying to make sense out of the nonsense. I'm here because my mother is here. <laughs> Dr. Helen Genver Smith up top. <clears throat> my mom practiced dentistry here in the state of California for more than 50 years, she was a pioneer. So open wide and say, ja. 
My sister is here as well, and my sister-in-law is here as well. I love them also. And uh, I love you too, my wife, Latanya. Kirkland Smith is here also. The last five years have not simply been years of loss. Mm -hmm. When we started this work, Latanya and I had only one child, and we now have three. And so life accompanies a lot of the sadness from the film. I think that's so beautiful. Um, in the play and in the film, we see this intense vulnerability. Um, your vulnerability as a performer, uh, Rodney King's vulnerability, the vulnerability of black masculinity, which is a radical rewrite from what we hear in popular culture. And uh, I was wondering if you would talk to us a little bit about that. You know, you've written about this work so beautifully in the Los Angeles Review of Books in an article entitled, Swimming with the Kingfish. Um, and I thank you for that tremendously developed thought and tremendously developed empathy, not simply for my work, but for the struggle, which is a daily struggle, I think, to be civilized, to work not only as an artist, as a professional, as a teacher, but as a citizen who hopefully is committed to progress, truth, all those good things. But in that pursuit, we often find ourselves in trauma. We often find ourselves shedding tears. We often find ourselves trying to reconcile loss at the same time we were trying to gain. But as the great poet Bob Marley said, you can't gain the world and lose your soul. Wisdom is better than silver or gold. Um, so, vulnerability, yes, absolutely. The speech that Rodney King gave, which I rendered in its entirety, I think is one of the great American speeches. And it's made by a man who is probably drunk, very disappointed about the not guilty verdicts rendered towards officers Kung Pao, Basino, and Nguyen, the men who kicked his ass a year before. A man who is brain damaged from that beating. A man who was not a high school graduate, who was diagnosed as a child with developmental disabilities. And a man who was traumatized by the loss of life that he had to absorb through his television set and then going incognito into the middle of the conflagration. 56 lives, at least, were lost. 56 blows were rendered. He had to absorb and live with that weight. And he gave that speech and he stopped the riot that other Dr. King never stopped a riot. He could prescribe, you know, the cause of the riot. But never did he stop a riot. But Rodney King did. 
And not everyone thought that he gave the kind of speech that he should have given. And if you want to, you can start reading the comments right now about this film and about the play and about how Rodney King is unworthy of 90 minutes or 60 minutes in this case of meditation. It's a waste of time and it's racist. But there were those same, same people who were out there anonymously on the day of his death saying that he deserved to die. So it's that weight that he lived with and I think tragically it's the weight that he died with. It's the weight that took him to the bottom of his pool. And you do give us a, a testament of his vulnerability and his amazing strength um, uh, through such difficult times, uh, through such a difficult personal history, that his personal history and the public history he lived through um, were both uh, an incredible weight upon him. Um, you also uh, call out in a really fascinating way uh, spaces of freedom in the performance and in the film. Um, how, how, how did you find those, uh, and, and how did those feel for you in the show? Well, the same space of freedom that I'm aspiring to is the same space of freedom that has been demonstrated to us by people like Max Roach and the Nicholas Brothers, whom I was watching today for some strange reason, who were doing splits and sliding and spinning on their heads and doing miraculous things um, with their human bodies. To feel that freedom as our great dancers, as our great musicians have felt and have, and have demonstrated and have articulated, I think has always been uh, a point of aspiration for me, you know? And I'm very fortunate to work with a Mark Anthony Thompson, for example, who is able to articulate through lyrics and through rhythm and through melody, you know, the things that I'm trying to get to through movement, words, silence, to find silence, to earn silence, to earn stillness, all of those good things that mean everything, you know? Rodney King is, is phenomenally scored. Um, your, your voicing and pacing the rhythm is in itself musical. Um, you bring us to something I, I know that you have talked about with me in the past, which is not just the importance of history, but the importance of theater. Yes, it's important. <laughs> Not only people. is it important, it's, it's essential. And without it, we're going to die. I think that's really serious. Yeah. I, it, it's, said. It's, it's incredulous to me that the first thing that we get from Washington, D.C., post-January 20th, is the contemplation of the eradication of the National Endowment for the Arts. As if we can somehow live without the arts, that we can somehow survive it, the loss of it, as the war machine builds and builds and builds. What we do in this darkened chamber, sometimes with a screen, sometimes simply with a stage, is something that we've been doing for eons. And it's something essential. It's necessary for the human process that we do this thing called a play, that we play. Um, I think that when we have the opportunity to investigate 
trauma on a stage, we are probably less inclined to instigate trauma outside the theater. So I feel sorry for those people who are allegedly our leaders, who obviously have been deprived of a proper education. Because if my mom hadn't had The World's Great Men of Color by J.A. Rogers, a two-volume set in our home library, or the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, an American slave, written by himself, who knows where I, I might have wound up. I might have gone to law school. Uh, Frederick Douglass now... <laughs> No, no, no. Frederick Douglass, Douglass now is, is going to see a revival on the stage. <coughs> more and more. <laughs> We're getting ready to celebrate the 200th anniversary of the birth of Frederick Douglass. That means bicentennial. <laughs> and uh, that's next year, 1818, 2018 kicking off a national tour in Romania, that's right, <laughs> in June. And uh, we'll be coming to a theater near you, undoubtedly. We just had a beautiful run at uh, Bootleg Theater, which was designed by Mr. Kirk Wilson. And uh, you're going to see Mr. Douglas up on that screen as well. <coughs> that's fantastic. Um, thank you so much. I. Uh I'm certain that there are questions, comments, responses in the audience. I know that all of you are even remembering what you were feeling, where you were in 1992. Um, and I, uh, I'm going to try and get to everyone. Your questions. Well, hold on. They're oh. going to leave because it's a school night. Okay. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead, number one. Wait for the mic. First of all, thank you for bringing us together. Um, I think moments like this create a sacred space in the presence of sacred beings. So thank you for that. A lot of us have been very reflective during these couple of days. Um, but in the beginning, you reminded me of like the um, what is the greatest tool in the hands of the oppressor, which is knowledge. And you made me think of Steve Biko. Mm -hmm. Steve Biko, if you guys don't know, his greatest quote says, the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. And I'm gonna repeat it again. Um, Steve Biko said, the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. And I think that's why they're trying to um, eliminate the arts because when shit goes down, we create beautiful oases. And I think we saw one right now. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on in my mind right now, but I think one of my questions was, um, um, I don't think a lot of people give you the credit that you deserve. I think you are one of the most amazing. That's not a question, brother. No, 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 no. But I, hey, but I, 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 but I appreciate but, that. But I gotta give you the props. I gotta give you the props that you deserve. Um, I don't think people take really understand like the the national treasure that we have in you. Like, like you just created, you created theater of the press without people calling it theater of the press. I think like you are probably one of the most radical actors out there speaking it and using your platform as an arts to educate us, right? And, and, and I've seen you at the Bullock Theater, I've seen Frederick Douglass, I've seen your plays, and I'm a, and I'm a de corazón, I, I appreciate you, I got mad love for you. But, but my question to you is like, like like, here's a question. Okay. <laughs> hey, this is this is cool right here. Hey, so so my, my my question is, how long it took you to write it? Because I know you did archives. How long it took you to write it? And what were your thoughts this past Saturday? Okay, thank you for that. I'm <laughs> Amandla. I wait to. Um, you know, I said. Father's Day 
June 17, 2012, on stage, second week of August. Jessica, what was the opening? When did we open? What, August 6th or something? Yeah, August 6th, right? So what's that, five weeks? Something like that, six weeks. Now, the piece was not written. It was, it was bookended by Willie D's Fuck Rodney King rap and Rodney King's Can We Get Along speech in its entirety. In between was completely improvised, um, what I called a post-mortem interrogation of Rodney. One of the one of the rules that I set up for myself in the improvisation was that I would not use the personal pronoun I in reference to Roger. I wanted to take myself out of the equation. I didn't want any kind of self-reference, even though obviously it's me up there on stage. And then to, you know, um, to find that rectangle of, of light, that corded microphone, to find the simplicity there. I communicated with Mark Anthony Thompson, who was in New York at that time, and said, yo, give me some bookends, bring me, bring me in, take me off. And, uh, and he provided that, I think, brilliantly. We got a snippet of that in, in the film. Um, and the piece continued to develop in that way. Bootleg, if you know it, is, is a great indie music venue. The walls are very thin. So whatever happens theatrically has to be done by 9 o'clock. <laughs> and it was August, and it was hot, and I didn't want to start at 7 or 7.30. I wanted to start at 8, and I said, Jessica, my producer, Jessica Hanna, I swear to you I'll be done by 9 o'clock every night. And invariably, the show was done by... 58, 58 minutes. And it worked that way all the way around the world. Whenever we took it, it was always 58 minutes, no matter what, you know, what, cir what the circumstances were. So there was a kind of internal metronome, you know, for, for the structuring of, of the play. But actually, the, the piece was never actually, quote unquote, written. Neither was a Huey P. Newton story. And uh, that piece, like Rodney King, uh, was not written until actually we knew that we were going to be doing a film and that we had to have a script and we had to do camera placement and, and what have you. But what you saw on screen tonight is a pretty good representation of the performance. It was shot in one take, outdoors. It was 102 degrees in New York City. It was part of a great performance series there called Summer Stage, which is free for the people of New York. Mm -hmm. Lower East Side, um, East River Park, the end of Houston Street, right there at the FDR Drive. Um, so, you know, it was, it was created with a certain expedience, but also with a certain flexibility. It's never a small thing to name the dead. And the, with the improv improvisation of the show, the ending has changed, um, developed recently. Well, yeah, Rodney King didn't say I can't breathe at the end of his speech. That was uh, appended because those were the last words of Eric Garner when he was choked to death in Staten Island. And Rodney King drowns in a pool and Eric Garner drowns by police. Yeah, chokehold. Mm -hmm. And immediately, of course, Spike did a cutting of the end of Do the Right Thing where Radio Raheem is choked to death by the NYPD and Eric Garner is choked to death as well. And of course we lost uh, the great Bill Nunn who played Radio Raheem just last year. We miss him. Um, and uh, that is, I think, something that you know, is, is, continues to weigh on, on us. Not simply as, as artists, but again, as citizens, as friends, as brothers. I had to sit up there and watch Radio Rahim, you know, be choked time after time, you know, and somehow incorporate that into 
a real moment of American cinema. But to watch something so similar, which is not a Spike Lee movie, is, uh, is a loss of a different type. Thank you. Um, there was a question over here. Sir. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. My question is, in light of contemporary society and all the things that are going on, and what you're doing in your work, what do you do every day, and what do you see going forward that gives you hope? Well, I have two small sons and one even smaller daughter. And one of our sons uh, was wearing a T-shirt with Dr. King on it. And a kid at school said, well, who's that, Obama? <laughs> no, that's Dr. King. They killed him because he had too much power. And then my other son said, oh yeah, John Wilkes Booth killed him. <laughs> so I know that there's a future. <laughs> we have a historian and a comedian <laughs> in the family. That's what I think makes it all worthwhile and makes it all so interesting and makes it all so necessary. There's a question here in the front. I'm here with Bob Johnson, a friend of his. Okay, I hope you don't get indicted. Okay. <laughs> I think you're selling yourself short. Yeah. Uh, I've watched you for a lot of years now. And uh, when you say that you had to intentionally remove the eye from the performances that you've been giving, I watched you in, watched you do Huey, and I didn't think you could do better, but you've come really, really close here, really close. And the thing that impresses me tremendously, while you may not know it, in watching you, it's not you once you get started. It is them. Somehow, they are taking breath and coming back through you, really. It's not you. That's how good it is. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you have a question. But <laughs> I appreciate those kind words. I, I think they're kind words. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Well, I followed all of your plays, and each one has a special place for me. Uh, I teach elementary school, and that is where my hope lies when you're sharing about your children. But especially now with the deportation, I have a lot of kids that are under that kind of fear. I, I have Muslim kids that are under that kind of fear. How are we going to communicate the truth? Because I push it a little bit. Some of the other teachers don't push it quite that hard. But the kids are there already. But how do we share those kind of fears, but also that kind of hope with the children so they know the truth and they can grow strong from the truth, even from the scary parts, to be able to be the ones to change our world because this is what I tell the kids every day, that they are the ones that will. So how do we connect that way without scaring them so much but still being truthful? I think this is one of the reasons why the hammer exists. This is 
the reason why CAM exists. Um, this is why the public library exists. Um, our mom took us to the Hyde Park Library on Crenshaw, my sister and me, and we would stack up as many books as we could possibly take out of that library and then go back the next time and get more and get more and get more. The, the process of literacy is not simply a process of, of reading and writing. It's a process of thinking creatively and thinking analytically. And the more exposure that our children are given beyond the simple exposure through those screens, which are so pervasive, um, that exposure is, is absolutely essential. And I salute you in your efforts, your daily efforts, to expose them to creative, analytical, and self-protective thinking because <clears throat> you have many children in our city who are um, the only English speaking uh, people in the household who are having to translate for their parents you see with when nice comes knocking on the door when the INS comes knocking on the door um, so the more um, exposure, you know, our, our children are capable of having, the more times they get to go to, you know, the Page Museum, the Natural History Museum, CAM, you know, um, the Hammer, the Fowler, all of these are great opportunities for, for our children. And, um, if you don't have children, then invest in some other children to take to the museum. And uh, we'll all benefit from it. Thank you for such a riveting performance. Appreciate you being here as well. So. I've Two questions. One, why the decision to go barefoot for the performance? And the second is, um, how would you like children who are born in the post Rodney King era, uh, maybe in the 2000s, that don't have a lot of knowledge around the history, um, to receive this performance that you that you delivered and, and move forward with the art? Well, we started um, <clears throat> we started this work at Bootleg Theater, which is a very low budget. Um, theater, and we couldn't afford shoes. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe next, you know, when I do Frederick Douglass, he'll have shoes. <laughs> and, uh, although I did a barefoot Frederick Douglass at bootleg. Uh, so. No, I think that there's a certain articulation through the foot, which is, you know, just as potentially effective as that of the hand. And because I'm dressed in all black, then that foot becomes more, you know, visible. Obviously, the water images and, and what have you. Um, and if you want to go back beyond that, you can, you know, we can talk about those days when, no, we didn't have shoes. Um, so there are those allusions as well. Um, and in terms of how do I how do I present this work to a younger generation? Well, I think that there are those of my generation who thought they knew Rodney King but really didn't. So I think that the exposure is important to them as well as the younger uh, folks as well. I did have some students for a little window of time who knew Rodney King from uh, Celebrity Rehab with Dr. Drew. You know, that's how they knew him. Or they saw him on the BET Comedy Hour, or they saw Celebrity Boxing, or, 
you know, or they saw, uh, you know, Jim Carrey and David Allen Greer on Living Color playing uh, Reginald Denny and Rodney King for 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 laughs. Uh, yeah, you saw that, right? Um, so, I mean, exposure to this, I think, takes the same sort of focus, which obviously is given to the tremendous work of, say, a Kendrick Lamar, whose artistry, whose rhythmic take on our life right now is so complex, so thick, so um, so L.A., you know. I would like for, you know, the generation that that absorbs Kendrick to absorb this work. Um, is there a collaboration in the future? <laughs> is there a collaboration in the future? It's asked. Well, to tell you the truth, Mark Anthony Thompson did a remix of Swimming Pools that we played way back in 2012 while Kendrick Lamar was still a rather obscure Compton poet who happened to put his poems to uh, music, and we love this jam called Swimming Pools, which is about multi-generational alcoholism. And it seemed to be the right thing to play as the people walked out of the theater. So is there collaboration in the future? I think there's a collaboration right now because we're communicating across, you know, across the same river, right? Speaking of rivers, do I see Michael Alexander there? Michael is, of course, founder and host with the most of a place where we had a wonderful run of Rodney King uh, downtown. Uh, it's called Grand Performances. And uh, Stephanie was with us there, and we had a wonderful conversation afterwards. Uh, one of our great comrades, and uh, we thank you for your continued continued work, and I'm glad that you could get a visa to get to the west side. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, I want to thank you so much, too, for giving us Rodney King as a corrective to those popular culture exploitations that you called out, that the, you give us an opportunity to remember anew in our own bodies, in our own families, uh, what this iconic person means to all of us, uh, how he connects to the lost lives that you also explain and call out um, in the show. That the, the, the project is one about history, but certainly one that's also so much about our future. Well, certainly Latasha Harlan's is a life that is worth our attention, our continued attention. And certainly what happened to her um, was something which went straight to that intersection of Florence and Normandy. Rodney King was from Altadena. He was not from South Los Angeles. Natasha Harlins was. A second generation handgun victim who wanted to grow up to be a lawyer. Um, I think it's essential that she be, I won't say remembered, because if you say remember, that means somebody has been dismembered. But I think that uh, if we invest our minds, our hearts, our vision on that 15-year-old girl who never had a quinceanera. I think we're better for it. And I think it's 
a way that we can move forward as we embrace not simply loss, but investment. The investment the investment that she continues to make in our spirit. Let's close it out there. Thank you so much. Good night. Brought to you by Xerox in four parts without commercial interruptions. The revolution will.